So we have our attendees joining us now. Fiona, we'll hand over to you and you can do an introduction in a minute or so when we have a few more people joined us. Yeah, no problem. Good afternoon, everyone. Everyone who's joining us, great to see everyone. We'll just give it a minute, folks, uh, as people come on to the webinar and then we'll kick off. Seem to have slowed down, to be honest, if you want yeah. to go ahead there, yeah. And I'm, I'm sure we'll have uh, a few additional people joining yeah. us as we begin, and that's fine. Um, so good afternoon, everybody. You're very welcome to our Seafood Knowledge Network webinar this afternoon. Uh, thank you very much for your time and your attendance. My own name, for those of you who haven't met me previously, is Fiona Leahy. I work with the Kerry Local Enterprise Office as the Business Advisor and Training Coordinator. And I'd like to welcome you here on behalf of the Local Enterprise Office. We're rolling out this event as part of a week-long national initiative called Local Enterprise Week. So we have a full schedule of events, both locally and nationally, um, aimed at small businesses, aimed at encouraging businesses to network, aimed at putting expertise out there, running loads of masterclasses, webinars, training programs from the 1st of March until the 5th of March. So there's still some, some time to jump on other events as well. If you have a look at localenterprise.ie, you can see a full list of the events there. This afternoon's event is specifically targeted at our very active uh, small uh, food producer network within Kerry. Um, I'd like to welcome Linda Gordon from Safe Food Network. Linda is going to give you an overview of the food safety supports that are out there for SMEs. So while we do have a wealth of uh, food production within Kerry, it's really important to know uh, what supports are available out there. Uh, Linda is also going to talk us through food poisoning bacteria as well, obviously very important to note. Um, Ed O'Neill will take us through cleaning and hygiene for SMEs. And James McIntosh will discuss food allergens. So folks, you have a wealth of knowledge here on this panel of experts. I would encourage you to make the most of their expertise, mine them for any information. Uh, we'll go through the presentations first and then you'll notice at the bottom of your screen there's a little Q&A box there. So as the presentations are, are running or indeed if you want to hold off until the end, we'll open the floor to, um, to questions and answers and if you have any questions about the services and supports of the local enterprise office for food producers as well. I'd be happy to take those. So without further ado, I'll hand you over to Linda. Thank you. That's great. Thank you, Fiona. And thank you for giving us the opportunity to uh, speak to your uh, local uh, enterprise clients, I suppose, and the people that you work with, whether you're in Kerry or wherever you're based, uh, you're very welcome this afternoon. Now, can I just make sure that my screen is visible. Yeah, you've got Linda. Will you so we'll do start with the slideshow. Thank you very much. So as Fiona said, what I'm going to talk about is just give you an introduction to the Safe Food Knowledge Network and the kind of supports and services and expertise and things that are available to food SMEs uh, on the island of Ireland. So who we are, first of all, if you're not familiar with safe food and some people aren't and then some people, you know, there is confusion between ourselves and other, you know, maybe the FSAI and people aren't sure of the distinction. But safe food and we're based in Cork, that's our headquarters and we have an office in Dublin and we're an all island government agency and um, we're one of the north south bodies set up under the Good Friday Agreement and we are responsible for promoting food safety across the food chain. So we're not a regulatory agency. I think it's important to make that distinction. You know, we're different to some of the, you know, the regulators that you will come across. We have, you know, no remit in terms of auditing or carrying out inspections or anything like that. We are all about promoting food safety. Um, with the idea that food safety is a shared responsibility. So it's shared between 
food producers, processors, retailers, people working in food service and catering and consumers as well. So everybody has their part to play in making sure that the food we eat is safe. Our primary focus as we report to the departments of health in both jurisdictions, but our primary purpose is, is public health protection. However, the idea being that the highest standards, having the highest standards of food safety benefits everybody. It gives consumers confidence in the food supply chain and it also helps to support food business. So by promoting food safety and by supporting food businesses, particularly small food businesses, to achieve and maintain the highest standards of food safety, we're ensuring public health protection and we're also helping uh, to support the, the agri-food sector, which is so important to our economy. Um, you know, we do recognize that many of you who are working in small food businesses are under huge pressure for time. You may have a very small staff, you may be working by yourself, and you have a lot of responsibilities in terms of producing your food or, you know, selling it, distributing, marketing, branding, all of that. And we recognize you're under pressure and that food safety is maybe not always at the absolute forefront of your mind because you've got so many different things to do. So our intention is to try and bring food safety to you, bring you the expertise that you can't easily access um, if you don't have a designated you know, technical person or food quality manager in your, in your business, we can help to support you and give you the information you need to protect your business and make sure that the food you produce is safe. And the knowledge network is what we use, I suppose, the program that we use to help promote food safety, not just to food businesses, but also to, to other areas. But looking at food business particularly, the idea of the knowledge network was to connect people working in food safety. So a lot of people are working separately um, and they're working in different sectors and they're working in different business areas and different disciplines. And the idea was that we would try and bring people together so that there's a shared understanding that people can share expertise. We often at our physical events will have people chat to us afterwards and one of the things they'll say is, I'm here from a food business and I've just been talking to an environmental health officer or I've just been talking to somebody working in regulation or in public health and it's you know I've got a much better insight now into into certain aspects of food safety that I didn't have before. We also try to simplify information and we make sure that the advice that we give people is really practical and easy to implement. One of our other roles is to you know, look at new, potentially new food safety risks and challenges that might come across and see how we can support people and help to, to address those challenges. In terms of membership, we have over 3,400 people and they're working in all areas. So anybody really who has in their working day an interest or an involvement in food safety, you know, the Knowledge Network is, is gonna be of benefit to you. So food businesses, obviously, people working in environmental health, in the regulatory authorities, people working in public health, food testing labs, and those working in food safety research and education and training. We have all of those people, food safety consultants as well as members of the network. So there's a huge range of kind of expertise um, across all those different disciplines. And what we offer to our members, you know, the services and the benefits that we provide are in terms of events, and these are among our most popular services, really, we provide training courses, workshops, webinars, conferences, a lot of these are, you know, in person events, we make sure that we try and we go around the island when we're delivering workshops, say for small food businesses, we will travel around to different areas. And we've been to Kerry a few times, we've given uh, workshops in Tralee and in Killarney. And we'll go to places where there's a high concentration of food businesses, but outside the major cities where we understand that people are under pressure for time, they don't, they can't afford to give up half a day to travel to, to a workshop or a training event. And so we try to bring the expertise and the advice to people where they are located. Um, obviously, we've been doing a lot of our, our uh, events online um, over the past year and we will be for a little while yet, but we look forward to getting back out there and getting to actually meet people and talk to people face to face. Uh, we also have a number of publications. We have a magazine called The Food Chain, um, which has a lot of different interviews with 
people working in different aspects of food safety, reports, um, event coverage, competitions, things like that. So it comes out three times a year and it's a really good read. Um, we have a monthly you know, electronic bulletin that goes out, an e-news bulletin that goes out um, to our members. And again, it keeps people up to date on what's happening in food safety, what events are coming up from our own events or other events that, uh, that people can attend that are relevant to food safety. And we have a number of articles then, which we call the future of food. So they're kind of looking ahead to what developments might happen, what are the new types of food products that people might be eating, what are the new challenges for food safety down the line. And um, so we publish those regularly as well. And they're, they just give you a, a slightly different perspective and they kind of look at the, the bigger picture of the, of the agri-food sector. We have a website where all of this information is located. And um, you can see the address at the bottom, safefoodkn.net. And we have news and updates that's updated several times a week with different news items. And then we'll update on all our events and things like that. We also have a special section. A couple that might be of interest to you are the sections on small food businesses. And there's another one on food hypersensitivity. So there's a lot of information. If you go into those, there's a lot of information, including things like how to find, you know, how to find a laboratory, testing laboratory and different things like that. Um, we also have on our website presentations from all our events, so we make sure that we put up the, you know, we put up recordings from webinars and we put up presentations from our events, so those are all available for our members to view. We also provide funding for if people need food safety training. Um, or if they, there's something they need to learn in relation to food safety or they need to upskill in, in uh, some way. We have a food safety skills fund. It's kind of on pause at the moment because obviously people aren't traveling to courses, but it does fund people to travel to attend uh, training courses and other types of, of upskilling activities. So that is one to look out for as well. We produce podcasts where we have kind of broad ranging discussions on various food safety issues. Um, and then we produce kind of ha practical how-to videos as well on things like allergens, hygiene and cleaning. So just in terms of the different kind of topics that we've covered and that we will continue to cover in our podcasts, our webinars, our events, you know, you can have a look there yourselves for everything from shelf life, how to work out the correct shelf life, um, you know, what are the new processing technologies, things like food fraud for SMEs, you know, so what simple things should SMEs be aware of when it comes to food fraud? What's the future for remote auditing? And then the basics of food safety, food poisoning, bacteria, avoiding cross-contamination, hygiene and cleaning, labeling and allergens. So all of these are, you know, very relevant topics to, to food businesses, whatever area of food business you're working in. So these are the kinds of topics that we, that we cover um, as part of our program of events and activities during the year. So who we work with, we're a small team in Safe Food. Um, so, you know, this about what there's six of us in the knowledge network team. So, you know, we can't we can't do everything and we're not experts in everything either. So we work in partnership with a lot of different people to try and bring you the best expertise and, and kind of the best quality service that we can. So we have a group of experts of 10 people on, a, on an expert group which supports the knowledge network. Um, and you'll hear from Ed O'Neill in a little while and he is a member of our expert group. And they're from a whole range of disciplines and food sectors from food service, food SMEs, hypersensitivity, research from, you know, trade bodies for food, etc. So there's a huge amount of expertise um, available to us and to members of our network through this expert group. And we also work in partnership to deliver events, for example, the event we're, we're um, delivering today with the local enterprise office in Kerry, but we work with Chagas, with the FSAI, with Camden in the UK and Queen's University Belfast. We work with Environmental Health Service on delivering, you know, some of our resources and training and things like that. So we try and work in partnership with as many people as we can to bring our members the the best expertise that we can and, and the best service. So we are all about, in Safe Food, we are all about working in partnership with other people. So just to bring to your attention a new um, service that we're producing that's coming soon, we're developing an e-learning resource for small food businesses specifically. 
Um, it will provide free online training in practical food safety. It will help with understanding why food safety is important, what can happen if things go wrong, and then practical advice on how to meet your responsibilities. This course is aimed at both um, food business owners and managers and their staff as well. So it's a, fr a free um, resource. It will cover a number of topics. There's eight different um, modules there that it will be covered. And you can see yourselves the, the different aspects. So it's covering pretty much every aspect of, you know, your food safety management in your business. And it, it, it you know, it'll be an engaging course and something that people will find easy to use. So if you want to um, keep up to date with this, if you want to be informed, it'll be ready within the next few months. So if you want to make sure that you find out about when it's released and that you can avail of it and have a look at it and see if it's something that you think would be suitable for your business and for training your staff, either now or in the future on an ongoing basis, um, you can sign up to become a member of the, the Knowledge Network at safefoodkn.net and then you'll be notified of any of our events, our training courses, our e-learning resource or any of our other new resources, you'll receive notifications. So you'll be, you'll have easy access to all of that information and expertise. So I'm going to hand over now. Thank you for your attention. And I'm going to just ask my colleague Tracy to share a very short video that will just give you an overview of our website and where all the different resources are located. So I'll Thanks, stop Linda. sharing. Thank you. And hopefully this will work now because it did work earlier today, but hopefully the technology uh, won't let us down. And here we go. The Knowledge Network is a free safe food resource which plugs you into an extensive food safety network of experts and information. It aims to keep small food businesses and those working in the food industry up to date on food safety. Joining the network is simple. Just go to safefoodkn.net and click the sign up button. As a member, you'll be part of a community of over 3,500 professionals working in food businesses, food testing laboratories, environmental health, research and education. You'll have access to food safety training videos and webinars, food safety advice, the latest event information, and the latest food safety news, and lots more. For SMEs, the Knowledge Network has a small food business portal with videos on food hygiene and effective cleaning methods, practical advice on applying food allergen regulations, expert presentations from SME workshops, and our food safety podcast series, as the number of those suffering from food allergies and intolerances grow, the Knowledge Network has specific resources for the catering industry, such as food hypersensitivity training videos, podcasts featuring industry experts, and food catering guides. Members also receive a free monthly e-newsletter with the latest on safe food resources, upcoming free training and webinars, as well as industry news and updates, and You'll be sent a printed copy of the Food Chain magazine, which is published three times a year and is packed with interviews, technical updates and competitions. So join now to be ahead of the game with the Safe Food Knowledge Network at safefoodkn.net. Back to you, Linda. That's great. Thank you for that, um, Tracy. Um, I'm just going to return to my presentation and we're going to move on a little bit now and just give you a flavour of the kind of information and, and that the, we provide around looking at food poisoning bacteria and what a small food business would need to know. Um, so I suppose looking first of all at the importance of food safety and the importance of knowing how to control and manage um, bacteria in a food business. 
you know, we've seen various outbreaks over the years hit the headlines and we also see, you know, problems and things, <coughs> excuse me, action that the FSAI has had to take um, against food businesses. Um, there was a very, I suppose, one of the most significant ones in Ireland in recent years was the salmonella outbreak in Dublin a few years ago where there were 50 people reported ill and sadly one person died, um, which is quite shocking in that outbreak. I suppose just brings home the seriousness of it for businesses, but also for public health. Um, the UK have had various, you know, we hear from other countries, bigger countries than ours, I suppose, regularly, large outbreaks related to different food types, salads, anything like that, where they've had an E. coli outbreak with 161 cases. If you have a food product that is contaminated and it is being produced on a large scale and being distributed across, you know, a country or between even member states in the EU or abroad, it, um, it can infect a huge number of people um in a fairly short space of time and then obviously the more number the more people that are affected then the greater the chance of very serious uh, consequences for some of those people how many people get sick from food it's a very difficult question to answer and it's one i'm often asked by i'm talking from a consumer point of view about food safety and people would ask me um you know, but how do we know how many people get sick? Like there's various research projects and reports and things like that and sources of data on this. But just looking at the World Health Organization in, the, in Europe, they say that every minute 44 people, more than 20 mi million per year fall sick from eating contaminated food and 4,700 will lose their lives. But the problem is that this is only really the tip of the iceberg. When you think about it, for most of us, if we come down with something, you know, gastrointestinal illness with vomiting and diarrhea or whatever, most of us don't go to the doctor. So in order for a case to be reported, the person who becomes sick has to go to the doctor and the doctor has to take a sample, which is then sent to the lab and the lab has to report back on it. So it's only when all of those steps are in place that we actually get official reporting. So we have the officially reported information and Number of cases, but the true number of cases is many multiples of the number of reported cases. So in 2018, EU member states reported um, about 5,000 outbreaks. So that's just outbreaks alone, not even kind of one off cases of food poisoning here and there affecting 48,000 people. So in terms of food poisoning bacteria, what you need to know they're one of the most common causes of food poisoning. You know, unlike food spoilage and, you know, we would often, people often do the kind of the sniff test and they think, well, if it tastes okay and it smells okay and it looks okay, it's probably fine to eat. Well, the problem is that it may not have spoiled. So food spoilage, you can usually detect by smelling it or by tasting it or by looking at it, but it won't tell you whether there are food poisoning bacteria or not. Food poisoning bacteria do not affect the taste, smell or look of food. So you cannot judge by those ways of, uh, you cannot judge whether there's food poisoning bacteria present or whether the food is safe to eat. So the different ways that food poisoning bacteria can contaminate food are that you can have transfer from raw product, for example, raw meat to a ready to eat food due to poor handling or storage practices. You could have it from food handlers who may be infected. Um, and if they're not, if they don't have good hand hygiene, they can transfer um, bacteria to the food. Or you could have, you know, something like a raw meat product or something that naturally has um, food poisoning bacteria present and then it's, if it's not cooked properly or if raw milk is not pasteurized properly then you can get a problem where the food poisoning bacteria will survive in the food. Then again if you have food that's not stored at the correct temperature something for example listeria could grow in that food and then cause food poisoning that way. So there's a number of different ways in which uh, food can become contaminated with food poisoning bacteria. And bacteria can grow to very high numbers if they're given the right conditions they can grow to very high numbers in a short period of time they can even 30 minutes or even slightly less than that the number of bacteria can double so you could get from one bacterium to millions of bacteria in 12 hours so that's why things like you know the different measures we have and if you've has a plan your different critical control points are so important in preventing that from happening so the kind of conditions that bacteria need is they need the right temperature and that's the most important factor. 
the temperature, what we call the temperature danger zone is generally between five degrees and 63 degrees. But between those two temperatures, bacteria will grow and they will grow very rapidly. So that's why we look at temperature control is so important um, in food production and in food processing and catering. You want to keep your cold food cold. So that's why you're keeping anything that's been chilled, refrigerated, frozen, it's below five degrees. And then you're keeping your hot food hot. So anything that's in hot holding will need to be above 63 degrees because you're trying to keep the any bacteria that might be present you know, uh, outside of that danger zone. They'll grow much more slowly at lower temperatures. So that's why the storage and cooking temperatures are so important. They also need nutrients, so they need a food source and they like foods that have high protein. So we think about our perishable foods that might have dairy, like dairy products, meat products, uh, egg products, those kind of things will um, be very favorable for the growth of bacteria. So those are the kind of foods that we would keep in the fridge and that are, are perishable foods um, and would have a use by date on them. They need a certain amount of moisture. So dried foods, you know, don't tend to support the growth of bacteria. Um, you know, if you think of like dried rice or pasta or something like that. Um, and those are the kind of foods that we would normally be storing um, at room temperature. And then they don't grow well in a very acidic product either. And that's why kind of acids are often used uh, to preserve foods. But those are the main conditions that bacteria need to grow. I'm not going to go through all of this very busy table, but it just picks out the four main bacterial foodborne pathogens, which would be Salmonella, Campylobacter, Listeria, and VTEC, which is a type of E. coli that produces a very harmful toxin. Things to pick out about that, points to note, is that there's a huge variation in incubation times. I know a lot of people say to us, and maybe even countered people saying it as well, they think, oh, I, I got sick in the morning, therefore it must have been the meal I ate immediately the night before. You know, that's not always the case. Um, the incubation times can vary. For salmonella, it can be 12 to 36 hours. So it might be the meal you ate a day and a half ago. For Campylobacter, it's a few days. So again, you're not just going back to the last meal you ate. Listeria has a much longer incubation time. That can be up to 70 days, but it's usually up to about two weeks. So again, it, it's quite difficult to kind of trace back where the food came from when you've got a very long incubation time, time like that. Another point to note about Listeria is that it can grow at very low temperatures. So again, that's why it's you would find it in foods that might have a long shelf life, like cooked ham or smoked salmon or something like that. So again, your storage is really important and your use by dates are very important here. It can be fatal in vulnerable people. And I think maybe we've all learned a little bit more about people being vulnerable to infection over the last year. And there are certain groups um, when it comes to food poisoning that are more susceptible and may develop a more serious form of illness. So very young children, pregnant women, older people, and then people whose immune system is compromised in some way because of treatment that they're on or, or another underlying illness that they have. So I think you always have to keep in mind the vulnerable groups when you're thinking about food poisoning and trying to protect people. It's, it's those people, you know, you're a healthy 30, 35 year old person might not barely notice that they have food poisoning, but somebody, it can be very, very serious then for somebody who is in a vulnerable group. So I think it's important to remember that. So cross-contamination is a way that often that um, food can become contaminated. It's where the bacteria might be transferred from one place to another. For example, um, if you have raw meat that has salmonella or you have raw chicken say that has Campylobacter, on it, which a lot of raw chicken does um, naturally, then if you chop that on a chopping board, then the knife, the chopping board, your hands and anything else that came into contact with it are now contaminated. And if you don't stop that, if you don't wash your hands thoroughly, if you don't, you know, wash all your utensils thoroughly, and if you don't have like separate chopping boards and things like that, if you don't maintain good separation, then the chances are that bacteria can spread to ready to eat food, a salad or something like that and could make somebody ill. So to prevent cross contamination, always clean as you go, wash your hands regularly, use cleaning agents and sanitizers, and we'll hear a bit more about that from Ed in a little while and keep raw food separate from cooked and ready to eat foods. So how does cross-contamination happen in a food premises? Bacteria can travel on hands, 
So we've just talked about utensils and hands, jewellery, tools, equipment, even your cleaning equipment if it's not maintained properly, hair, that's why it always needs to be tied back and covered, water, food, and you know, as I said, your cleaning equipment, clothes, uniforms, shoes. So that's why personal hygiene, cleaning, good hygiene standards are so important in a food business to try and protect the food that you're producing from being contaminated. So I'm not going to go any further on this today, but if you want practical tips and advice on hygiene and cleaning in your food business, we have a couple of uh, videos on safefoodkn.net, um, which look at effective cleaning for food businesses. And Ed, as I said, we'll talk about that in a minute and also personal hygiene and what to look out for and the really practical steps in preventing cross-contamination and contamination of your food. So with that, I thank you for your attention. If you've got any questions, you can put them in the Q&A. And I'm going to hand over now to my colleague, Ed O'Neill. As I mentioned, Ed is a member of the expert group that advises the Knowledge Network. He's um, working now as um, O'Neill Food Solutions, but he's recently early taken early retirement, and I stress the early <laughs> early part of that, from Chagas, and some people may have encountered there. Um, Ed has many years experience of supporting small food businesses, so he has a wealth of expertise, and uh, we're delighted to have him join us this afternoon. Is that okay? Can you hear me? Yeah, you fine, Ed. Okay, right up. Um, now, screen wise, is the screen okay? We just need you to go into presentation mode. Oh, Lord above. Yes. Very demanding, I know, I'm sorry. Yes, I don't even have a cursor. <laughs> uh, here we are. There you go. Here That's your good here to go. Are. Here we are, sorry. Now, good afternoon, everybody. Um, thank you, Linda, for the introduction. Uh, until recently, I was an artisan food specialist working with Chagas and decided to take early retirement for my sins. Um, delighted to continue working uh, uh, with some wonderful colleagues in Safe Food. And I'm also a member of their expert group. And um, today we're going to take a quick run across a number of areas. Uh, basically, my current company is called O'Neill Food Solutions. Um, and I have been involved in technical support in assisting people in product development, troubleshooting. Um, in relation to packaging, I've done uh, for Safe Food a number of presentations, including a podcast on packaging and how packaging can help in terms of food safety and so forth. Um, as part of my brief, I work on hygienic design of food premises. Food safety is a key issue. And cleaning and hygiene, again, we have done a number of presentations, podcasts, and so forth. And I also have a great deal of experience on the processing and manufacture of a range of food products uh, throughout the country of Ireland and abroad. We'll start off firstly with packaging. And packaging gets, generally speaking, a bad name. We only see the cornflakes box when the cornflakes are gone. We only see the egg carton when the eggs are gone. And we sometimes forget that the functionality of, uh, of, of packaging is one of protection and preservation. And it's about getting your uh, hard-worn, hard-earned, hard-produced food products out to the consumer in a safe manner and to protect the contents within that package. And to see how big packaging is as an industry, there's 320,000 products are packed every second around the world. And that's four times the number of hits that we have actually on Google. So it's a massive, massive industry. And when we talk about packaging, it takes many, many forms. There's, there's glass, there's paper, there's plastics. Plastics have been around since 1925. They get a degree of bad publicity um, because not many of them are biodegradable or recyclable. And so we tend to see them thrown on the side of the road. Uh, we heard about plastics in sea and so forth. But again, we must go back to the functionality. And sustainability plays a big role nowadays in food packaging. Um, can we use compostable packaging? Can we use biodegradable packaging? But when we talk about packaging, we also talk about shelf life. And a very, very good figure is that if we increase shelf life, 
by 100%, the waste products are reduced by over 40%. And this is a very, very good fact to be aware of when we are actually talking about packaging. And at the end of the day, is packaging justified? Well, I believe absolutely. You can extend the shelf life of very energy intensive products, thus minimizing the environmental impact through waste reduction. You should also know, we often talk about the term carbon footprint. 97% of the carbon footprint rests within the actual food product itself and only 3% within the packaging. Another area of my work is that in cleaning and hygiene. And it's an area where people fall down an awful lot. The first picture on the left hand side, clean first, disinfect second. What we found in, especially in our, in our face to face um, workshops that we've run throughout the country um, and in the north of Ireland is, is that We've often asked people, you know, and what cleaning chemicals do you use? And they don't actually know. They can tell us that it's XPX 100 or whatever else. But a lot of the time, they actually don't know what they're doing. And so what we try to do in a very, very simple fashion, and again, we've done this in videos and in podcasts as well, is to get through to people to understand, first of all, their food product <clears throat> and what's in their food product. So do you have fat? Do you have protein? Uh, are there sugars in there? And so forth. And, and an analogy that I like to use when I'm talking about cleaning is when we drive our cars, not very often at the moment, but we hopefully during the summertime, we get out to drive our cars and we have lots and lots of flies and insects and so forth stuck in the bonnet and the windscreen. And when we come to clean our car, we go to our car wash, they're incredibly difficult to remove. And why is that? Well, a lot of them have become dried on to the bonnet, the glass or whatever else, but they're made up of fat and protein. And the bottom line is, if we don't, generally speaking, remove this fat and protein very quickly, you can cause contamination in your food processing environment. So again, it's first of all, knowing your food product, and secondly, then, how do I clean my equipment so that my food surface for the next round of food products, be it a beverage, be it a sauce or whatever else, is perfectly clean. And that's where we have to understand the various cleaning chemicals, whether they're caustic sodas, whether they contain um, chelating agents, whether they can contain other agents to help in the cleaning process. So again, Get to know what your detergents are. Are they anionic? Are they cationic? Okay. Um, do they contain surfactants? These are surface active agents. All right. And again, all very, very important to understand. And it doesn't matter whether you're a deli or whether you're a very small producer or quite a large SME. You have to be familiar with your product. You have to be familiar with how it's cleaned and to make the food surfaces that you're using safe for the next round of products. The picture on the right-hand side, I'm not sure if it's very clear to you, but it's a foggy machine. And these are often used, especially in the larger food premises. When food production is over, we can spray chemicals into the air. They get into every nook and cranny, and they kill bacteria, yeasts, molds, and so forth, and commonly used in the food industry, but not obviously while people are working. I put up this slide on biofilms because biofilms are quite common in the food industry and they result from improper cleaning. So you may have a fatty product, for instance, and you don't use the proper detergent or the proper temperature with that detergent to remove those fatty products. And what happens is there are a group of bacteria uh, which are what we call non-pathogens. In other words, they don't themselves cause disease, but they have the ability to grow and produce sort of a sugar type compounds, protective um, sugary layers, okay? And these protective layers can help other bacteria, which may be pathogens, to grow inside. And over a period of days and weeks, the bacteria grow away, grow away, and as the size shows, they break open. And when they break open, this can result in cross-contamination. 
It can be incredibly frustrating for a food producer when they're getting their products tested in a registered lab that every now and then we have a spike or a peak in, in a particular type of bug. Where's it coming from? And often we find it's down to biofilms. And how do biofilms uh, arrive at, at, at a dangerous situation? Improper cleaning or inadequate cleaning in the first place. So it's very, very important that when it comes to cleaning and hygiene, take advice. Take advice, okay? Take advice from the cleaning companies, be it Diversity, Biocell, or whomever, as to what is best for your situation. But don't be afraid to ask the question. And as Linda has said early on, there's a huge amount of resources um, from ourselves within uh, the Safe Food Group and on the Safe Food Knowledge Network. Don't be afraid. There's no such thing as a silly question because we've come across almost all of them at this stage. And when we talk about cleaning and hygiene, the first thing we look at is the actual premises themselves. And we have a degree of expertise in hygienic design of plant and equipment and how best it suits a particular environment. And some of the work we do is about literally going into a place and looking, be it a bakery, be it a dairy operation as well, not to be going back on yourself to try have a nice flow with your product and not to have cross-contamination between raw product and heat-treated or pasteurized product and so forth. So there's a lot of expertise out there and a lot of information available. I'm part of a team of expert consultants and trainers, and we deliver a series of workshops throughout the country. At the moment, these are online, but hopefully, as Linda said, maybe later on in the year, we'll get back to meeting people face to face. Between us, I'm not sure it's a good thing or a bad thing, between us, we have a combined experience of over 125 years in the food industry, both at home and abroad. Take advantage of that experience. We like to think we have a degree of expertise that we can disseminate to, disseminate to SMEs that are on the ground and assist them in developing their developing their products and their companies in a very, very safe manner. The bottom line is there's a lot of help out there. Don't be afraid to ask us. Thank you very much. Thanks, Ed. Okay. Thanks, Ed, for that. Um, just a flavour, I suppose, of the kind of the expertise of the kind of work that that Ed has been involved in over the years. So we're, we're delighted to have his expertise as part of the network. So I'm now going to hand over to my colleague, uh, James McIntosh, who also works for Safe Food. James is our toxicologist and his area of expertise, as well as in chemical contaminants of food, but also um, allergens. And uh, James has done a huge amount of work across the island of Ireland around um, you know, control of allergens in food businesses. Um, so I will hand you over to James now and he will give us uh, an overview, I suppose, of uh, what you need to know about allergens. All right, thanks Linda and thanks Ed. I'll just try and share my screen here. So bear with me, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it worked this morning. Um, so maybe you could tell me if you can see that. Uh, yeah, it's good. You just need to go into presentation mode. Is is that okay? Still in the not quite there yet. Yep, all good. So I just go back to the start here, and okay. Thanks very much, um, Linda, and thanks Aid. And I think at this stage, um, having spent a year in lockdown, we're probably all feeling one hundred and twenty-five years of <laughs> years of age anyway. Aid. Um, as Linda said that uh, I've spent the last five, six years now at uh, this stage um, um, giving workshops to SMEs, to early childhood providers, uh, to catering lecturers up and down the country and in Northern Ireland as well uh, in the whole area of food allergens. And it's not uh, an exaggeration to say that it actually terrifies some people. Um, I was looking through the list of the attendees today and most of you seem to be food manufacturing businesses, but we also have some caterers there as well. And um, 
I suppose in today's presentation, it's very short. I've had to condense a lot of information into a short uh, space of time. Um, but I just want to hone in on one or two issues that I think are important that have cropped up again and again uh, for both caterers and manufacturers. Uh, and, and which um, I, I suppose really is, is just to help you uh, pr protect yourselves really and uh, protect your, your customers as well. Um, if you look at the product recalls, now I got this off a colleague of mine in the Food Safety Authority and they take note of the, re the food alerts that's published warnings about food products that are then recalled or withdrawn from the market every year. And if you look at the stats from last year, back five years to 2016, you'll see that on average, I mean, if you're, you're taking average those percentages, it's roughly half of all the food product recalls each year in this country uh, are due to food allergens. Now, when I say they're due to food allergens, it's invariably due to some kind of mishap with the actual labeling on the product. So you're talking about that a particular product was put into the wrong wrapping or the allergen was in the list of ingredients, but it was never emphasized uh, and so on. So you're talking about pretty simplistic, you know, there's nothing actually wrong probably with the, the product itself. It's just that the labeling was wrong and therefore it presented a threat to people who would have been allergic or intolerant to that particular food. Now, I don't have to tell you, ladies and gentlemen, but this is, if you like, um, this is food waste really isn't it i mean if if that those products have to be recalled and they they weren't spoiled and they were within their you know best before a date for instance uh can they be re reused or if not do they have to be discarded uh that's a as i suppose a classic example of food waste and the, the sad thing there is that you'll see that there's no trend downward in those statistics over the last five years so it still is is, is quite a problem and as a small, particularly the small food manufacturers, uh, I don't know if any of you have ever had the experience of having a product recalled, but it's probably not something that you'd wish to repeat again. It can be quite, uh, you know, an impact on, on your business. Um, so look, just very briefly, what are we talking about when we, when we talk about allergens? Well, okay, allergens are, are usually proteins. Now you might say, okay, sulfur dioxide is said to be an allergen as well. Um, and indeed, people can have allergic reactions to some food additives, for instance. But by and large, what you're dealing with are protein, and it's it's a natural constituent of the food. It's supposed to be in there. So allerg a food allergen is not just, or an allergy to food, rather, is not just another form of food poisoning. Linda spoke about bacterial food poisoning, for instance. Now, if any of those bacteria get into our food, we're all at risk of getting sick. But what you're talking about when you're talking about food allergy or food intolerance or even celiac disease as well, when it comes to gluten, you're talking about perfectly healthy, fresh, uh, good quality, normal foods that you're recommended to eat. Uh, and for instance, I can eat egg. I don't have an allergy to egg, but if somebody who had an allergy to egg and they could, they had a small bit of scrambled egg or something, they, they could be in very serious trouble. It could actually, if, if it was a severe allergy, it could actually kill them within a space of 10 to 15 minutes. So that's what's frightening about food allergies. They do tend to hit the headlines when things go wrong. And uh, I'm sure many of you might have remembered one or two cases over the last five years where uh, the deaths of particularly some young people have happened uh, due to food allergy. So you might say then, well, oh, well, how do we get rid of them? Well, I remember back from in my, my days in, uh, in, in college that uh, if it's a protein, in order to destroy a protein, you've got to boil it in hot concentrated sulfuric acid for two hours. Now, if that doesn't tell you how tough it is, uh, I don't know what will. Um, but they are very hard to get rid of. I mean, you, you can denature a protein with heat, etc. But sometimes that has the effect of actually making it more allergenic. For instance, roast peanuts are more allergenic than unroasted peanuts. So the question is, well, if you can't get rid of them, how do you manage them? Um, you, you basically apply the principles, what are called HACCP principles, uh, to the management of food allergens as well. Um, I'm not going to, going to go into those now because I don't have the time. Uh, there are a number of resources available, freely available online to help you do that. But one thing I would draw your attention to is that one of those principles is to document everything you do, okay? With regard to allergen management, take notes, document everything, and have a paper trace with regard to everything you do, okay? Um, why bother with food allergen management? Well, it's the law. You have to do it. There's no alternative. Um, 
food allergies and intolerances are probably more common than you might think. If you, it, the statistics are that about 1% of the population have celiac disease, um, about 3% have food allergy, 5% have, in around 5% have lactose intolerance. They think, the experts think that probably up, upwards of 5% have what's called non-celiac gluten sensitivity. And then you've got a whole plethora of other um, intolerances as well. Now, if you go online, you'll see everything from 10 to 45 or 50 percent of the population have what's called a food hypersensitivity, which is the umbrella term for food allergy intolerance and celiac disease. Now, if you even if you take a conservative uh, figure after that, we say 15 percent, you're talking about anything upwards of 700,000 people in this country would have some form of food allergy, celiac disease, or food intolerance. So that's a very big cohort, ladies and gentlemen, and probably, you know, that eats into your customer base to some degree. So you can't ignore it. In any case, as a food business, whether you're in catering or manufacturing, you have an obligation to your customer's health and quality of life. They are completely reliant on the accuracy of the information they get with the food products that they buy, whether it is in a restaurant or in a shop. OK, they are totally reliant on that information and the accuracy of it. There is no cure for a food allergy and intolerance. What they have to do, they must avoid the foods that make them sick. And there's research to show that that's easier said than, than, than done. And of course, to be bloody minded about it, it actually makes sense from a business perspective when you take into account the numbers that I've just iterated, but also when you consider the, the new trend towards clean label and um, you know gluten free, dairy free, meat free, things like that, uh, which is a mega trend worldwide actually. Um, so you can't afford to ignore it. Now, if in a normal world where we could meet in a, in, in a, in a venue and have, and have an exchange of ideas and questions, and that's one of the things that I miss about this medium, um, I ask you, well, what kind of food allergy and tolerance queries do you normally come across in, in, in your business? Um, I would wager that uh, you probably get, maybe get questions about the gluten content of, of some of your foods, particularly in catering, you've come, come across a lot of, of, of queries, gluten, I mean, anytime we ask this question, gluten seems to be one of the most popular, and that's borne out then by some of the research that's been done. I pulled this from a Mintel report. It was done back in 20, 2017, 2018, and it was a survey of 2,000 people on, on the island of Ireland, both in the Republic of Northern Ireland, and they were asked uh, if they avoid particular foods because a particular member of the household had a, an allergy intolerance to them. And, of course, uh, gluten, quite unsurprisingly, comes out on top followed by dairy, wheat, and lactose. I think it's interesting they separated lactose from dairy. I would have thought dairy was the main source of lactose and nuts uh, and fish and shellfish. They'd be the top six from that, um, from that survey. We did our own survey in 2019. Uh, this was a survey of caterers. And we asked them, well, what were the most popular food allergy related requests they got? And once again, of course, celiac um, um, or uh, gluten free, really, or celiac containing gluten was the, uh, the main request, followed by peanuts, nuts, milk and egg. And if you actually look at the details of the food product recalls in the FSAI, uh, they vary slightly from year to year, but the tops are always milk egg and nuts, funnily enough. Now, I'm not going to go into the 14 regulated food, uh, foods that cause allergies and intolerances. Uh, I'm sure you, many of you are familiar with those. If you're not, you should all be familiar with them if you're doing, running a food business, uh, because these are the allergens that you need to control uh, in your food products. Um, <clears throat> There, that's the, the regulation there is regulation 1169 of 2011 it came to force in 27, 2014 actually the end of 2014 uh, so it's been around for about seven years and moving on for seven years um, the allergens any of those 14 allergens must appear on your product label if you use them as ingredients or if they are in if they are ingredients in ingredients that you use for your product uh, they must be emphasized in the list of ingredients ingredients uh, on your product label. Um, be careful, um, as some are, not, are quite specific, it may not be obvious. What I mean by that is there are six cereals and eight different forms of nut. 
listed in that legislation. And if any of these are an ingredient in your product, product that's what actually goes on the label. So for instance, if you had a, you know, for the sake of argument, a hazelnut, um, a hazelnuts in your, in your food product, uh, it's, it's not sufficient just to say nuts on the label. You must say hazelnut. Um, there are six cereals, but in, in, in essence, two of them spelt in camels are forms of wheat. So for the purposes of labeling, uh, you have to consider, does your product contain wheat, rye, oats or barley uh, as an ingredient? And that's what appears on the label then. If you want, by the way, to add in gluten, you can. You can do it in brackets afterwards. But always remember, it's the actual allergen that needs to be emphasized. And I don't know about you, but most of the products that I look at, uh, the allergen is labeled or is highlighted in bold, bold script. Uh, there are exceptions, by the way, to the labelling requirements. I'm not going to go into those. They're specified in the annex to this legislation. You can act, they're listed also on the FSAI website. There are things like um, uh, there was one product there, ice and glass. It's um, it's 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 a structural protein isolated from fish bladder, and it's used as a clearing a. Um, uh, what is it, a fining agent in the production of wine. So I don't know if any of you are producing your own wine and maybe you, 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 need, you need a clearing agent. Um, well, if you use icing glass for that purpose, then you don't have to label your wine um, as containing fish, for instance, uh, because um, obviously in the production of this particular product, there's no risk of allergenic proteins um, getting into the product itself. Uh, just to highlight that of those 14, sulfur dioxide is the only one that really has what's called a labeling threshold. In other words, if, if you use it, you need to work out the concentration in your final product. And there's a threshold there. And if it's above it, you have to label. If it's underneath it, you don't have to label. Okay, but that's that's for anybody who has uh, who uses uh, sulfites or sulfite um, based ingredients in their in their products. Now that's the easy bit. They're the allergens that you know about, they are your ingredients. What about allergen cross-contamination? What's the risk of allergen cross-contamination in your product? Or if you're a caterer, what's the risk of allergen cross-contamination in the meals that you provide? Okay, it's the same question. This is the main worry really for people who have food allergy or food intolerance, uh, whatever the source of the food. Um, this is really where things go wrong, okay, uh, for them and where you get adverse reactions. It's also the reason that underpins the use of what's called precautionary allergen labeling, also more familiarly known as, as may contain labeling. Now, you know what I mean. You've seen it all in products, may contain gluten, may contain nut. Um, there's a variety of phrases there, produced in a factory where our nuts are also used, et cetera, et cetera. Um, it's important to know that there is no legislation underpinning the use of precautionary allergen labeling, right? It's entirely voluntary. It was actually developed by food businesses uh, as a way of communicating to their customers that there was a, a chance of an allergen ending up in, in that product because of the um, production environment in which that product was produced. The only caveat to its use is that it shouldn't mislead the consumer, the end consumer. Now, unfortunately, um, uh, the FSAI did a survey there in 2011 and they looked at precautionary allergen labeling and they took products that had this on the label and then they tested that product for the allergen that it was highlighting and in 94% of cases that allergen was not found in those products. Uh, so did that represent an overuse of precautionary allergen labeling? Quite possibly yes. Um, <clears throat> so the question to you is when do you use precautionary allergen labeling? Um, do you carry out a risk assessment in your own kitchen or your own your own um, your own production facility? Now, risk assessment it means different things to different people, but basically, look what you're asking is what are the chances of an allergen that shouldn't be in one of your products getting into one of your products, and how does that happen? Um, I've come across cases where a product had um, may contain peanut coming from an environment where they didn't use peanut at all. So why would you put that on your product? Um, you know, what does your risk assessment show? Did you actually assess the risk of peanut getting, even though there's no peanuts in, used in your, in, your, in your production facility? Um, 
what about your supplier, for instance? Um, what can you ask your supplier? You should be able to ask them any, any question at all. Now, so, some people recommend that maybe you should change your supplier if you don't get adequate information for them. Well, that's easier said than done. Uh, you know, as once you once you once you get the exact specification and the exact ingredient that you want from a supplier, you're really not in a position to want to change that maybe. But ask them if they provide you with raw material and that raw material has may contain labeling on it. You're more than entitled to ask them. Well, look, did you do a risk assessment and is that what you've done or are you just putting it on? because you know you think there might be a chance of uh, without any risk assessment um you have no way of knowing how you know how true that that is or how accurate it is and that goes for caterers as well by the way um if you're if you're labeling your menu items um and you have a product there that says may contain nuts for instance and in a menu item you know where, where the nut was wasn't used as as an ingredient um you know what you do it's a very difficult question to actually um answer there's no legal obligation for you to transfer that may contain labeling from an ingredient to your product because there's no legal basis for its use but of course the trouble is that we've never actually um tested that in irish law there's inf insufficient case studies to date. Uh, who's to say, for instance, that um, you know, if something was to go wrong, somebody was to take a reaction, that their senior counsel wouldn't say, well, did you check your ingredients for any may contain labeling for this? And why didn't you pass that information on? It's, you know, it's a, you, we could speculate here all day as to what would happen, but it just hasn't been tested. It goes back then to the whole issue of document everything that you do um in the case of for instance a caterer if somebody comes into your restaurant and they have an allergy and they, they wish to eat they probably more than likely they will engage with you anyway and they may well ask you look i see that the menu items don't contain a particular allergen but was there any precautionary allergen labeling on the ingredients well if you if you have to document the allergens from each of your ingredients anyway it, it, it's no it's no big extra deal to actually note if there's any uh, may contain labeling on it as well in your documentation and pass that information on if you're required to do so um in uk law it's a statutory defense due diligence and the reason i bring up uk law i know that they have left the european union but at the same time um it's common law and Irish law and UK law are very similar in that regard. Um, the defence is it is a defence for a person charged with the offence to prove he or she exercised due diligence and you took all reasonable precautions to avoid committing the offence in the first place. And therefore, the reason for the event was well beyond your control. OK, that's the due diligence defence. There's no such thing as no risk. But there is such thing as reducing the risk as uh, to as low as you possibly can. All right. So how do you prevent allergen cross-contamination? Well, I'm sure you'd agree with me that some allergens are more difficult to control than others. I mean, it, it, it's obviously, you know, easier to control celery, for instance, than it would be to control gluten. If you think of opening a packet of flour, it just goes everywhere uh, in a room in no time at all. And it can, it can land in surfaces, it can land in foods, etc. cetera. Um, since I said all, most allergens are proteins, that means they're sticky and they can stick to the side of utensils and wax etc um, and they can build up in the films you know the oily films that maybe um, exist at the side of utensils so hot water and detergent and a good scrubbing basically is needed to remove them don't forget uh, things like reusing oils uh, if you had fish if you cooked fish in in in, in, in vegetable oil and you reuse that to you know cook chips or something you know, chances are your chip's going to be absolutely smothered in fish protein and therefore dangerous to somebody who has a fish allergy. Uh, so it's just common sense steps, really, to uh, preventing cross-contamination. Linda dealt with this uh, with regards to uh, microbial control, but it's fundamentally the same principles that you apply to allergen control. Allergens can move from one food where they should be to other food where they shouldn't be. Um, and it's, it's a matter of just uh, doing your own risk assessment or assessing the risk uh, of that happening. Errors and oversights. Yeah, inadequate cleaning of shared equipment is um, 
it, it would be a source of allergen contamination. For instance, if you if you were to put um, non allergen containing products through um, uh, first before an allergen containing product, uh, the use of rework. If you um, do you add like with like uh, rather than wasting the the material, um, ingredient changes from your supplier. This begs the question. Um, the chain of information in your company. I'm sure many of you probably are, you know, have very small companies. Maybe they're just one or one or two or just a handful of people. But who's responsible, for instance, for getting the allergen information as it comes in to your company from your supplier? Is there somebody uh, charged with that task? Uh, and then moving it up the line to make sure that you know that the correct information is established at the very beginning of the process and that's then carried through to the final product um it, it, do you have a do you have a new product development uh facility in our companies that large for instance or is it is it the buyers maybe do you have a buyer or are you the buyer um are you responsible for getting this information from from the start and making sure it's accurate and then feeding that that back into your system these are questions that you need to ask and don't uh, forget terminology. Uh, some of the ingredients, you know, mightn't be that obvious. Lysozyme, for instance, lysozyme is uh, is used as um, an antibacterial or a preservative. Um, it's found in your tears, by the way, and it's one of the most potent antimicrobial substances uh, we know. Uh, but lysozyme from commercial lysozyme is usually um, obtained from egg, and it is itself an allergen. Okay, so uh, just be aware of that. And um, it's good to have an allergen control plan. I'm sure you all have to some degree at this stage. Um, and I'm not going to go into the detail on this. There are some principles around for an allergen control plan, but the, the number of, you know, for you have to fit it to your particular uh, business and your particular circ circumstances. Um, <clears throat> and finally, just to reiterate some of the resources that we have. Uh, Linda's gone through those, and uh, they were mentioned in the uh, in the video. I'd also highlight, by the way, that we we have some um, resources for uh, dealing with gluten. Now, just to be aware, uh, particularly if you're in catering, um, of the terms around the use gluten free and very low gluten and everything you can and can't say the legislation, the specific legislation underpinning gluten. And it's very, very tight. So just be careful of that. You know, if you want to produce a gluten free product, or indeed you want to offer a gluten free choice, or if you're asked by a customer for a gluten free option. Okay, just be, be, be very careful uh, when you in the in the language that you use, really. And I leave it at that. So thank you. And I think we're now ready to go into the question time. Thanks, James. Um, that's given everybody a kind of a, a whistle stop tour of the Knowledge Network and the kind of expertise that we have available to us and the kind of services we offer. So, um, you know, you're welcome to join us on safefoodkn.net. And I would recommend you just even take a look at the website because most of the you know, a lot of the stuff that we've talked about today is available to, for anybody to look at. So you've got to just have a look around the website um, and see what we have available to you. Um, we've recorded today's session uh, and I think uh, Fiona will be sending out a link to that and the, there'll be information on them. Um, there'll be an evaluation form. So we'd welcome your feedback and information on how to join. So thank you. Yes, time. absolutely. I'll be sending out that information. And thanks very much to all of our speakers today, James, Ed and Linda. Um, really informative presentations. And I know each of you referred to it, uh, keeping it uh, short, but God, what a wealth of information within that time frame. So thanks very much. Um, now, can we um, open it up? Does anybody have any questions? I didn't see any questions coming in throughout the, the presentations. I think people were just riveted. So uh, if there's any coming in now, as I said at the start, folks, make the most of these guys while you have them here, just uh, to their knowledge, their information. Um, there was a lot to take in there. Um, and I suppose it is an area that 
maybe everyone is, is slightly apprehensive about too, you know, and um, like James, you mentioned it nearly, people being nearly overcautious with the, the may include, you know, and when it's not necessary and things, but um, so yeah, people being very, very cautious. Um, do we have any questions coming in? There is, um, Miriam is coming back to us with a question in a moment, I think. So I suppose setting up your kitchen at home, where to start? I know this is uh, where a lot of our own clients start, um, a lot of early stage food producers who are at that idea stage and maybe um, looking at exploring the feasibility of a food product and stuff. They're all starting in their kitchens at home. They're not out in the commercial spaces yet. Um, and look, I suppose there's a certain um, pros to that, but there might be certain cons as well. Any advice to, to food producers starting off at home? Well, I suppose the first thing we would always advise people is to get themselves registered, you know, and contact their local environmental health office. And, you know, the environmental health officer or the regulatory authorities can be a great source of information as well. And um, so they will need to be registered. So they need to ensure their compliance with the legislation. And I suppose that's kind of not not our areas and um, would be more with the FSAI as distinct. But I suppose there is plenty of practice, like the advice and the information that's on our website and that we've given today, like some of them might sound, it's not relevant to you, but you know, the basic principles of food safety are applicable to everybody, regardless of what your business is. So your first step is to make sure you're registered and that you're compliant with the law and then to start informing yourself about food safety and look at as much information as you can look at your, you know, your setup, look at your, your ingredients, um your suppliers make sure you know making sure that you have all the documentation that you need things like your traceability and then you know the basic principles about cross-contamination about allergen control about cleaning and hygiene you might be doing it in a much more simplified way than a big business but those basic principles still apply to everybody so would kind of you know step one is is making sure you're compliant with the law and then and then is informing yourself as much as you can learning as much as you can about um about food safety and you know kind of improving your own knowledge all the time and that's where maybe something like our e-learning resource could come in handy for anybody who doesn't really have a background in food safety or much information that will be available in the next few months we would hope before the summer so you know if you want to join the knowledge network you'll get notification when that's available or just keep an eye out for it but that would give a very good grounding in food safety for anybody who doesn't have that as a background. We have a generic guide to starting a food business as well. I've just linked it there through the chat. Um, it's number two there on the, the Business Plans and Knowledge Centre part of our website. And it'll just give you a couple of steps um, when, you're, when you're starting up. So you might have a look at that as well. Now, there's a few more questions coming in there, Linda, with regard to dates for the training webinar. So people who sign up for the Knowledge Network, they'll be informed of those. Yeah, we have um, we have a webinar on the 21st of April that Ed and I and another member of our expert group here in Jordan will be speaking at again around food safety. So it'll be some a little bit of what you've heard today, but more advanced more information on it we will be doing another one on HACCP later on um but we don't have a date for that yet like your best bet and I know I keep saying it but you're you know the best way to keep informed is to join the knowledge network it is free to join so you can just sign up it's a very simple process and you will get notifications then of um our events as they come up and you'll get we get the monthly bulletin and that will tell you everything that's coming up in the next month so mm -hmm. that is the best way but I think the 21st of April is probably the next one that would be of relevance James I don't know if you have any allergen events coming we do we're, we're planning them again this year but we have no set dates we're hoping to run one we're hoping to run two actually in in May um one is would be for food manufacturers and the other for um food uh, caterers so they would be going to more detail in, in what I've approached today. And then we're hoping to do the same thing again later on in the year, perhaps, perhaps towards October. We have no set dates for those yet. 
unfortunately. But again, join the Knowledge Network and you'll get a bulletin mm -hmm. and you'll, you'll be reminded of the dates. <laughs> And I suppose similarly, we, you know, we would do not training as specific as yourselves, but I suppose just in general, starting up food businesses and things, we do an awful lot of that training as well through the local enterprise office. Um, so certainly, you know, you can sign up to our own newsletter as well. Just, I suppose the best thing is to be kept informed, guys, when all this stuff is coming up, you know, mm -hmm. so just ensure that you do get that information. I know we're all bombarded with emails and stuff at the moment, but, um, you know, it's just better to get those emails and if they're not relevant you can just dismiss them and delete them um some in uh questions here about getting help setting up a HACCP plan for your business uh well you can contact the local enterprise office and we can uh, guide you there and and direct you in that regard um a specific question on shelf life on fresh sausages with no additives um i suppose look until you do the proper testing, it's probably guesswork to a certain extent, but any guidance there regarding that? Yeah, it's, I mean, it's difficult to give that kind of guidance um, in this format. You do need to do testing for shelf life. You do need to talk to a laboratory about the best way, um, about the best approach to that. We do, we have run training courses on shelf life for, food businesses we did one online and um, late last year and we would hope we might do one again later on and um, but I suppose it is the kind of thing that you need to get that you need to get a laboratory involved in um, to, you know to make sure that it's done properly um, mm -hmm. and but you know there's a certain amount that you can you can learn and there's an FSAI um, guidance note as well on shelf life forget what number it is it might be 18 but i number 18 is it 18 18 yeah, yeah can, so can i jump in there linda please just for a moment yeah. uh, in, in relation to the sausages we, we have a we have uh, my former department of food industry development department at chagas and ashtown mm -hmm. they have uh, a degree of expertise and equipment that will help people with shelf life so you might want to introduce gas flushing and things like that so the person to talk to up there would be kira mcdonough uh, Kira, C I A R A dot MacDonough, M C D O N A G H, at Chagas dot I E, and Kira, Kira would gladly offer some advice on 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 that as well. Perfect. Um, now the person who asked that question, they did come up. Uh, they came back to say that their sound is gone, but this will all be recorded so they can review that yeah, information yeah. again. Um, a question about how best to display allergens to customers uh, doing takeaways. They have an existing restaurant, but um, do you need signage up to display that? Is it on your takeaway menus? What way would you display allergens in that instance? And the golden rule is that you have to give the allergen information at the point of presentation, sale, or supply okay, okay. Uh, that, and that's the same right across the right across the board for businesses mm -hmm. um the uh, i remember early on mm -hmm. in this pandemic a lot of the um restaurants here in cork were starting to go into you know takeaway mm -hmm. um, uh, um takeaway structures because not to stay afloat really and i remember one uh, i got a, a something in the door from one with a menu but there was absolutely no allergen information on the menu there was a link to a website but their website didn't have the allergen information either okay so just to be careful of that um if you if somebody somebody with an allergy or intolerance get your menu they need to be able to make the choice from that menu so they need to have the information there so they might ring you up you could give it to them over the phone but you also need to have it written uh, when uh, that food is delivered or if they're if it's a click and collect when they come in to to pick it up and it must be supplied but they have made the choice by then so they have, you know they'll ring you up and say you know i've I, i'm alert i've got celiac disease for instance so i have to avoid gluten and mm -hmm. you can work with them then on, on on a suitable a suitable choice in the menu if they've acquired your menu in advance maybe there was a, a mail shot or something you know or you know they're going to leave it in the door uh, it's as well to direct them to a website where that information exists or to have that uh, uh, your menu choices labelled on that flyer as well for the allergens they contain, okay? Because they need to make that, that choice there and then. Okay, brilliant. Um, how important is swabbing to verify my cleaning in my production kitchen? And will cleaning records be enough or should I do the swabbing? 
swabbing swabbing is 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 something that's done on, on an occasional basis, on an occasional basis, but not on an everyday basis, right? Uh, your cleaning records are sufficient um, if they're followed precisely, right? Mm -hmm. uh, swabbing is simply a backup to confirm that what you've done is working. That's all it is. Mm -hmm. But you would not, it's, 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 it's quite an expense involved in, in, in swabbing. And depending on the size of the company and what you're swabbing for and so forth, right? But, but uh, again, there's a huge degree of error. Who's doing the swabbing, you know? Uh, our colleague Kieran Jordan, who is not here with us today, um, Kieran has specific tools for swabbing properly. You know, it's not like getting a cotton bud and running over here and putting it into a tube. You know, there's a, there's a, a, a certain way of doing it. But swabbing for me is is a backup to confirm what you're doing already is correct. But it would be done on a regular but not daily basis. Okay. Perfect. Great. Thanks, Ed. Um, when producing jams and marmalades, uh, lemon juice is used. Does that need to be included in the label and do they need to be tested for shelf life? Uh, I'm afraid you yes, have to include yes, lemon juice. Yeah. It's, it's an ingredient. Um, lemon juice is usually added. Some people add citric acid to bring the pH down to between 3 and 3.8. At this point, the pectin or the gelling agent works very, very well. That's why lemon juice is added. However, it must be declared on the label, mm -hmm. right? In terms of shelf life, when you the reason you hot fill jams and preserves is that you cause a vacuum. And you know, when you, when you open your, your, your lid, it's very, very difficult to remove because a vacuum has been formed. And because of the vacuum there, it means there's no oxygen. So you don't have uh, yeast and molds growing. Therefore, you get long shelf life. What you would normally do is you would retain a certain number of samples and send them off to a lab, you know, so if, it, if it's jam you're doing, you know, you wouldn't send them off every week. You might send one off every month for so many months, just just to back up. But you are allowed, when you start off uh, packing the products, such as jams or sauces, you're hot filling, you're allowed to use comparable shelf life uh, uh, results. In other words, you know, if, if, I'm, if I'm doing a, a, a jam in a jar and the competitor has 12 months, I, I see nothing wrong with using six months. You know, and, and and then back it up according to your HASA plan, your method of manufacture, and so forth. Okay. Great. Thanks, Ed. Um, there doesn't seem to be any further questions coming in there, folks. So I just want to take the opportunity to thank you all. Um, as I said, fantastic, very informative presentations and uh, some very practical tips there as well for all of our food producers here in Kerry. To all the attendees, thank you so much. Um, it's great to have you on board for this webinar this afternoon. As mentioned on, at the start, we will be sending out the recording of it. So that'll be a great reference tool for you. Um, any queries, come back to me directly within the local enterprise office. And thank you as well to Tracy, who was uh, ensuring everything was running smoothly in the background. So thanks very much. Thanks everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.